welcome to Decred In Depth, your source for all things Decred. I'm your host, Angelo, and on today's show, I'm interviewing Jay-Z, international ops lead for Decred. Jay-Z has been around the project from the very beginning and is now currently responsible for dealing with institutional investors and all major exchanges. I hope you enjoy this conversation as we dig into the essence of what Decred is about and all its fundamentals. Started. This is Decred in Depth. I'm your host, Angelo, and I'm here with none other than Jay Z from Decred. Today, we're going to sit back and cover all the basics, I would say. So, we can call it DCR 101. And the point of this episode, I want to say, is to give everyone an introduction, a good fundamental structure of what Decred is about, you know, an episode that you could use and play back for some time. So, Jay, how are you? Angelo, I'm fantastic. Happy to be here with you and uh, happy to be on Decred in Depth, even though we're not really going into depth. We're just going to scratch the surface. That's episode two. You know, the, the, <laughs> the J- depth. Jay-Z, Jay-Z round two. The depth comes later. Okay. <laughs> so let's get right into it. Um, who are you? And let's talk about your inception into the crypto space. Who am I? It might be a little too early for existential questions, but uh, I- I'm, I'm Decred Jesus, haven't I? <laughs> um, yeah, so I'm Jay-Z. Um, I was an equities and futures trader for about 10 years, uh, kind of got the crypto bug in 2010, and I've been kind of following the space really closely since then. And uh, when I got involved with Decred, I kind of took the, the full dive and just do this now as my, my full-time gig. So let's talk about Decred. So w- what is Decred and, and why is it important? Decred's actually really interesting because, you know, I, I think Decred kind of uh, builds upon the promise of, of Bitcoin. You know, a lot of us got super excited about Bitcoin, the, the idea of self-sovereignty for your money. And Decred kind of just extends a lot of those ideas in really, in, in really simple ways. I mean, how we go about it is actually, you know, complex if you, if you were looking at the code. But a lot of the philosophy behind it is, is really simple. Understood. So... Let's get into Decred's birth and the origin story. Where did Decred come from? Sure. So um, it, it's really interesting, you know, because there's, there's a little bit of mystery behind Decred as well. You know, it's similar to, to with Bitcoin, I mean, Decred is kind of like the merging of two groups. So you basically had, um, you know, this, this amazing dev team that was working on Bitcoin at Company Zero, which was called Conformal Systems uh, previously, um, before it became Company Zero. Um, and uh, Taco Time, who was the founder of Monero, who basically wrote this this white paper called Memcoin 2 that looked at Bitcoin and, and thought about ways that you could improve it. Um, so kind of changing the model from, you know, one CPU, one vote with Bitcoin to this sovereignty model whereby coin holders would have the voting power to decide on the future of the coin. So, you know, with cryptocurrency, you know, whoever controls the consensus rules controls, you know, all the power. And what Decred does, and, you know, we're really kind of the only ones who, who do this, is take that power and really define who's going to have it explicitly in the code. And we make the answer to that is, you know, the coin holders, the people with the most skin in the game. So that's what Decred is. It's, it's a proper aligning of the incentives that was kind of missing from Bitcoin, kind of like that unfinished piece of the puzzle. So I'm going to throw another name in there in InSoc. So we had Company Zero, we had Taco Time, and we had InSoc. Yeah. What information do you have on them? Um, not very much, actually. So um, what I can say is that, you know... Ta- well, and their involvement. So Taco Time was an extremely talented individual. And, you know, they, they were the ones that forked, you know, Monero away from the, the shadier actors and, you know, made it a le- the legit project that it was today, along with some others. Um, and, you know, the, the Memcoin 2 paper was really, you know... Uh, ideas about going back to Bitcoin and, and improving that and saying, look, if, if you were to design Bitcoin today from the ground up, what would you change? Um, and, you know, In- Inksoc was basically, Inksoc is not a dev, as far as I know, um, but they were, they were kind of like the, the front man, let's say, uh, for, for a lot of it and helped, helped organize this project. Um, so Inksoc had approached uh, 
conformal systems back then, um, and Jake and the team there that was working on BTC Suite and kind of pitched them this idea of, hey, let's turn this into a real coin. Let's make Memcoin 2 something real. And that thing eventually became what we know today as Decred. So let, let's let's go into some of the differences between Memcoin 2 and Decred because Taco brought the, the Memcoin 2 right. paper. That is correct, right? Yeah, the... Off the top of my head, I mean, I, I can't get like too deep into that, but like I so do. So let's cover the basic points. Yeah, so sure. Some of the most important. Uh, the most important one, I think, I mean, the one that stands out to me, uh, I mean, some things are missing. So I, I, I know that the paper talked about like colored coins and stuff like that. But the main thing that I say is missing, which is kind of a testament to the way that Decred works, um, is kind of ASIC resistance. So I know that like, that was one of the key points of Memcoin 2, that they wanted it to be ASIC resistant. And what we learned uh, looking looking deeper at that, um, when you when you take a critical eye to it, is you know that would have been a mistake. But the key feature is the hybrid proof of work, proof of state. Correct. System. That's the main thing that was taken from the paper. That's the cornerstone of Decred, and what what I would relate closely to Memcoin to, that you know the hybrid proof of stake, proof of, of work system is what makes Decred special, um, and and very different from anything else out there. So you know people think of Decred as a proof of stake coin, it is, but it isn't. It's not pure proof of stake. Decred takes everything that's good about Bitcoin, everything that worked, all that good stuff, there's just no sense in throwing it away. You know, We don't have this kind of like not invented here syndrome. When you're doing science, you take the stuff that works and then you, you try new things. So Conformal Systems is responsible for BTC Suite. Correct. For those that may not understand what that is, mm -hmm. let's get into that. Sure. Um, so like, one of the things I do, like I'm not a tech guy, I mean, I, a bit, but you know, I was an investor. So when I got involved in Bitcoin, my idea was, look, I'm not in a position to judge the quality of a lot of these ideas, right? So I got to do a lot of research and I want to learn kind of from the most intelligent people in the space. And, you know, guys like, um, you know, the, the Bitcoin project lead, Gavin, were super smart guys. You know, guys like Mike Hearn, who were working on the project, super, super smart guys. You know, Greg Maxwell, the people who are still there working on Bitcoin, there was tons to be learned from them. But one of the things that, you know, was in the back of my mind was this idea that, you know, if Bitcoin's going to become a money protocol, you're going to have to have multiple implementations to have the most robust network possible. I mean, that for me was something that you just couldn't argue. Uh, I mean, I know people will argue against it. And you even point to Satoshi saying, you know, one implementation to rule them all. Um, but, you know, I, I think people who really uh, have thought it through, you know, you're not going to have one TCP IP stack. You're not going to have the internet running on one piece of software. And then, you know, if something goes wrong, everything breaks. Uh, so that, that was really important. So when I saw, um, you know, a few years in, uh, Jake and the gang basically saying, hey, you know what, we want to do a full node Bitcoin implementation, BTC suite. And that's basically writing the Bitcoin software from scratch so that you can run it and interact on that exact same chain. But if there's a bug in one of those implementations, it won't burn the whole network to the ground. So that's the really important point. You know, if you have multiple implementations on the network and something goes wrong with one of them, you have like some kind of crazy bug. And we saw this last year. This isn't like purely theoretical. There was a CVE last year. I think it was called like 2018-17144. Um, I could just be making up numbers, but like I think that's the one that it was. And it was essentially uh, – an issue, there was like a DOS vector, so you could DOS nodes and knock them offline, but there was also a potential stealth inflation bug in there where someone could arbitrarily print Bitcoin. And the thing is, if you got one piece of Bitcoin software and it's vulnerable to this and it prints a bunch of fake Bitcoin and people start accepting them and they circulate, you've kind of broken Bitcoin. You know, um, but if you have multiple implementations and nodes are rejecting these transactions because, hey, the bug that you have in your piece of software isn't in my software and I know that this is BS, right, that kind of protects you. So for me back then, that was the kind of thing, this was 2013, where I'm like, hey, these guys are super smart. If they can actually pull this off, this is going to be amazing for the whole ecosystem. And, you know, that's essentially what they were doing with BTC Suite. Now explain what an implementation is, because some may not know what that is. So we have different programming languages. Right, correct? exactly. So, I mean, what, what the BTC Suite is, is essentially a Bitcoin full node. So kind of like Bitcoin Core, but written in Go instead of C++. All right, so the exact same 
speaking the exact same language, speaking Bitcoin protocol, but written in a totally different language. And that has to be built from the ground up. Yes, it does. And it's, it's not the kind of thing that anyone's going to go bang out. If you can bang something like that out, you're like, you know, you're top, you're God level uh, program. And the thing is, you know, people were skeptical about it. You know, the Bitcoin core people were skeptical about it. Everyone else. I remember people talking about it and saying, you know, you guys don't know what you're biting off. It's probably going to fail. And when they delivered, uh, you know, a lot of people were impressed. So how did BTC Suite and the Memcoin 2 paper come together to form Decred? Um, that's a little more ambiguous. But what's interesting about it is, you know, Taco Time wanted to produce Memcoin 2. And at some point they approached Jake and they had already done some work. And they based, they based that coin, they based Decred upon BTC Suite and added that hybrid proof of stake, proof of work uh, model on top of it. So they basically forked the code base and built a new coin on top of, you know, what Bitcoin was, and then approached Jake and the team and said, hey guys, you know, do you want to pick this project up and make it, make it something real, polish it and get it into shape where it's, you know, can be an actual coin. So let's talk a little bit about Company Zero and their involvement with Decred. Who is in Company Zero? Um, Company Zero is quite a few people. So, I mean, Jake is not only our project lead, but he is CEO of Company Zero. And they're, they're all the ones, essentially, that are co-founders of Decred and spearheaded the project. So uh, in there, you had quite a few very talented people, you know, Dave Collins, um, David Hill, um, Josh Rickmar, um, and, and a, few, a few others who are extremely talented. We can't forget Marco. Marco Pierboom cannot be forgotten. No, cannot um, forget Marco. He, he's I, I don't even know what title we give him, but he's like you know the, 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 I think it was the proof of concept maestro. So like he he invents stuff that doesn't exist. You know that's the thing. We, we, that's the cool thing about Decred. We take something that does exist, is super stable, and works really well as our foundation, and then we build cool stuff that's never been done before on top of it. So let's cover some more of the genesis of Decred, and the pre mine, the airdrop and what your definition is of a fairness launch. Uh, Cool. So fairness is always difficult, you know. Um, Bitcoin's kind of the gold standard for a fair launch, but even there, you know, we could pick nits about that. And, you know, there are transparency issues. But with Decred, we tried to be as transparent as possible. Um, There were significant issues with, you know, when you're doing hybrid proof-of-stake, proof-of-work, the people who are going to be in control are the people with the coins, right? Right. So when you start it off, it's really important that, you know, trustworthy people have some coins and that there's wide coin distribution. Because if you start it up like Bitcoin and say, hey, anyone can mine it, you know, and whoever mines it is going to have like all the control, um, then the issue is that if some big proof of work miner comes in and mines a bunch of coins and starts staking right away, well, they can do whatever they want. So what happened with Decred is, you know, we recognized a few things. One, developers needed to be compensated for the work that they did. You know, Decred's the culmination of years and years of work. Um, so there was a pre-mine, and it was split equally. 50% went to the co-founders, and 50% was freely given to community members who were interested in Decred. Now, now the percentage of the pre-mine that went to the co-founders, what was that for? Um, so the, there's kind of a misconception sometimes that, you know, that was to, you know, reimburse them for the work that they had done, you know, on BTC suite and all that, but it was totally separate. You know, that was for the work that they did on Decred. So BTC suite was totally separate. And, you know, Jake had spent probably millions of dollars building that Bitcoin software because he loved Bitcoin, you know, but then when they went to do Decred, you know, that was a totally separate thing. And that's essentially what that 50% went towards reimbursing them for the ton of work that went into launching Decred. Um, Because, you know, everyone can say, hey, you know, the Satoshi team worked for free. Um, But that's not actually true either, right? I mean, when you have, when when you're the first to do something, you have a significant advantage, right? If if Decred would have been first come, first serve in terms of coins, you know, those people that busted their their asses for years would have probably not been able to mine uh, anything. Uh, So it was important that people get compensated. and that, that's part of the fairness, at least to me. Understood. Let's cover some of the consensus algorithms out there. So what is proof of work? What is proof of stake? And why is Decred's hybrid model important? Okay, so I mean, proof of work is interesting. I mean, it's, it's the gold standard, right? But th- there's an issue with it. So um, in proof of work, you're basically uh, having a lottery. 
um, to solve puzzles. And when you solve a puzzle, you can essentially create a block. Um, and that that's great, um, but the best proof of work currency is going to be the one that has the most hash power, the most people competing to solve these puzzles, right? And there can essentially only be one, right? So you can have a million proof of work currencies, but the one that's going to be the best is the one that's most secure. And that's going to be the one that has the most hash rate behind it. Um, so competing in that space really doesn't make any sense because being the coin with the second most hash rate really doesn't have any benefit, especially if you know, you're based on the same uh, code base as Bitcoin, um, so yeah, that, that was something that, you know, people, people ask sometimes, you know, could Decred convert to pure proof of work or proof of stake? And I mean, the latter might be possible and might make sense one day if proof of stake is ever proven to, to make, uh, to, to be as good in terms of security as the hybrid model. But in terms of pure proof of work, there are enough flaws with it, especially if you do not dominate the space, um, that it would not make sense to be a pure proof of work coin. Um, Proof of stake? Um, so proof of stake, the issue there is, you know, the, the nothing at stake problem, right? If you're going to issue coins out of thin air, um, they really aren't probably going to be worth anything more than the thin air that they were issued from. And then whoever gets them is in control, right? Um, so if they're just minting more coins and paying themselves, whoever started with control keeps control forever. And, you know, Decred is designed with that in mind that, you know, even though you know we the devs don't start with the full control in decred because of the airdrop um, it's very important that all of us get diluted even those of us who received free coins like myself it's important that everyone gets diluted because that's one of the strengths of the project bringing in new talent new people and having them able to give a have a say so iterating on the hybrid model what is blockchain governance and what makes decred different um, so what is blockchain governance? Um, there's so many answers to that, you know, people say, uh, Bitcoin doesn't have governance. It's, which is a form of governance. <laughs> and not only that, but I mean, the white paper basically outlines Bitcoin's governance. It's, you know, one CPU, one vote. I mean, that's, that's what it is. You know, the whole hash power lottery, you have more, you got more tickets, you got more chance to win. Right. Um, so Bitcoin's governance is basically hash rate, you know, CPUs voting, um, which is fine. It's it's a valid way of of, of p playing that game, but the issue there is uh, incentives and how they're aligned. Right, um, you and I could own tons of Bitcoin, right? But if we don't own hash rate, we don't have any power in the project, right? And people can say, "Oh, you can run nodes," but to me, that's just like a, a Sybil attack, right? I I could own no Bitcoin and have a thousand nodes operating. You know, should those have a say? Um, so, I mean, that's kind of the Bitcoin governance. Um, Decred's kind of formalized that governance on chain, whereby there's no wishy-washy answer. Like you could ask someone, what's Bitcoin's governance? And they could say, oh, it's a one CPU, one vote. Oh, no, no. It's, you know, the broad, the broad consensus of the community and including Twitter and Reddit and all, and all, and all those trolls and cutouts. Um, they could have a myriad of, they could say, hey, you know what? It's just Blockstream and whatever the hell they want. Um, it's just the guys who control access to the consensus rules and, and that GitHub, they're the ones who are in total. I mean, all those answers are valid, you know, because um, there's, no, there's no real precise answer other than the one in the white paper. Um, but with Decred, we actually have a precise answer, and that answer exists in the code. It's the stakeholders who have chosen not only to hold Decred, but to lock it up so that those, those coins can be converted into something that gives them the ability to vote on chain about stuff like the consensus rules. So how are the block rewards distributed in okay. that system? So this, this is the interesting part because, again, you know, Bitcoin works. Proof of work is a great way of constructing blocks and securing a network, all right? So we, we totally recognize that part, and that's why, you know, proof of work is, is a fundamental component of Decred. And as such, 60% of the block reward goes to those proof of work miners. Because, I mean, we all understand anyone who's ever tried to mine knows that it's a pain. And, you know, there's a lot of complexity. You know, you have to have make investments in hardware, electricity, you know, manpower to run these massive installations. So, you know, because of those capital expenditures, it makes sense for the majority of the block reward to go to proof of work. The other thing is that proof of work is an amazing way of distributing coins, you know. Just because you're mining coins of proof of work doesn't necessarily mean you're going to hold them. You know, you'll sell them to pay for that electricity, to pay for new hardware. And that effect distributes the coins through the market. Um, now, 
30% of the block reward goes to proof of stake. And proof of stake is really important because that's, that's what gives Decred, um, you know, that multi-factor security. Um, it, it looks at those blocks essentially as they're coming down that production line and says, hey, you know, these blocks, I mean, they all have to conform to the consensus rules to be, to be distributed, but we can still look at them and say, hey, is there something wrong with this block that we don't like as a community? You know, are, is someone mining empty blocks? Should we, should we sl- you know, slap them down for that, give them the stick for that? Um, and we have the option to do that as a community. So 30% is rewarded to the people who are essentially you know, being vigilant 24-7 and, and watching and seeing what miners are doing. And then 10%, this is what really, really separates Decred from the pack. 10% of that uh, block reward is going to a project treasury that is controlled by those stakeholders. Now, getting into the voting system a little bit more and the incentive model for Decred, when the proof of stake holders are voting, how what does that model look like? Okay, cool. So uh, it's really interesting because there's there's two kinds of votes with Decred. Um, the most important stuff, the stuff that everybody fights about and kind of ruins coins, is you know consensus. Um, so we have the ability to vote on the consensus rules, which are the most important because these are basically the laws that govern your cryptocurrency. And how that works basically is that people are able to encode those votes as they're looking at those blocks that are coming down the production line and vote on things. Like let's say we want to raise the block size from the current um, 384K to like 2 megs. Uh, what you do is you basically code up that change, put it into the client – Right, dormant, that code would be dormant, and then basically we'd have a vote. And as those blocks come down the line and we say whether we like them or not, we'd also vote on that active agenda. And if enough people voted, if 75% of those inspectors, those tickets were voting, um, that vote would lock in and then just automatically activate. So it's not a signaling vote. It's not saying, hey, we want the devs to go do this. It's voting on something that's already been built and deciding whether or not we want to activate it. And the second model, which would be Politeia. Yes, Politeia is really interesting because that's what we use to, you know, signal things and distribute those treasury funds. So that that is a little uh, a little more complex in a way because it's happening off chain. So the idea is, you know, what's really cool about Decred is, you know, none of us are ideologues. We've seen we've seen kind of the pitfalls of ideology. You know, like hey, let's do everything on chain. No, we should do everything off chain. And, you know, suddenly you have this schism and now we're going to fork and have two different coins, right? One doing, pursuing one and pursuing the other. You know, we think that like we can look at things rationally and say, hey, you know, some things belong on chain and some things don't. And, you know, a lot of these signaling votes um, and things where there's going to be massive amounts of data tied to them don't belong on chain uh, is the view. So what Politea does is it basically takes that ticket pool, all those people who are able to vote on the consensus rules, who have converted their decred into tickets to vote, and it, it polls them in a way whereby they're able to use their coins to vote on things like spending proposals. And the way they do that is all those proposals get put into this system called Politea which is essentially like a Git repo on the back end. So everything gets put into Git, and then everything gets hashed into a Merkle tree, and then the Merkle root gets um, gets taken and anchored into the blockchain in the op return of a transaction. So basically, you can take a whole amount, a whole a huge amount of arbitrary data, hash it down to like one little string, and put it in the chain so that you can validate everything. So that I, if I censor you, you can go and prove going back to the blockchain, that, hey, someone deleted this proposal I made. You actually brought up a really good point right now that that I didn't think of using Polite as a signaling method whenever sure. we do need a consensus vote to get a, almost almost something like a pre-approval before the work is actually done and being and, and yeah. is built. So that that's super interesting because that's something that we really thought about because, um, you know, we have a good example of that. So we actually used the on-chain voting system to signal something once because Polite didn't exist. So we we signaled basically if we wanted developers to start working on Lightning Network. And that was really important because, you know, building out Lightning Network support was going to cost a ton of money. And, um, you know, it it would be kind of crazy to, you know, do all the work and then have a consensus vote over whether or not that stuff should activate, right? Um, So what we did first is, you know, 
poll the community. And but when I say poll the community, I don't mean like go have a Twitter poll. Have an actual poll so that the people with the most with the skin in the game um, get to vote their their coins. So if the majority, seventy five percent, wanted Lightning Network. Uh, we would actually start building that. And, uh, you know, one thing was really cool is that we found that when you actually have to have something attached to your vote, it's not just like, oh, I can arbitrarily, you know, create 100 Twitter accounts and, you know, say this or say that. When there's actual capital backing those votes, money, um, you know, a lot of things that you would think are super contentious just aren't as contentious. Um, So Lightning was a really good example because when we were talking in chat, you know, people were fighting over it. But the the vote passed with like ninety eight percent plus support in the end. So let's get now into where people can purchase Decred and what are some of the outlets and exchanges that um, that offer services in purchasing. Sure, this is this is always a challenge, uh, <laughs> but there there is an ever expanding list. So I mean, Decred mostly has Bitcoin pairs. Uh, fiat on ramps are are just starting, and there, there's a few of them. And they're smaller, so people can go on you know the Decred.org slash exchanges and see some of those. But um, you know we're we're on all the major exchanges. We're on Binance. You know we're on. OKX, we're on Poloniex and Bittrex, and that that list is constantly expanding, and that's something that we spent a lot of time on. Because as a project, you know, we're very careful with that treasury. We don't we don't spend it, um, you know, foolheartedly, and you know, get these exchange integrations for whatever they may cost. We're, we're really careful with that, and we're looking at. Decred's built to last. You know, we're, we built a, we're building a project here that should be around in 20, 30, 50 years. Um, so, you know, if we're going to spend, you know, a dollar today that might be worth $10 tomorrow, um, you, you always take that into account. That being said, money needs to be spent today to realize that future value. But uh, I'm just saying that basically uh, we're, we're careful with how we do that spending. So exchanges are something we always like integrating with. But We've been a little slow there, and the reason is, you know, uh, we're not we're not spending like we won the lotto. Understood. What are some of the options that we have for wallets? What do you What do you recommend? Um, so, like, I'm a CLI guy, so <laughs> I like. Oh, Jay, not. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> okay, yeah. So if if you don't want to do the CLI stuff, um, Decrediton is really where it's at. I mean, if you want to stake, you want to use Decrediton. Um, so that's the native Decred wallet that actually uses the CLI tools on the back end, Angelo. So it's you're just, it's just stressed out. You, yeah, you're using the CLI tools, but you don't. It's a it's beautiful. It's got a beautiful interface. I mean, Decred actually has like some of the most amazing designers in crypto, I think, and you really see that in Decrediton. Uh, so staking is super simple. Um, and, and that's why, you know, more and more people are doing it all the time because they just realize, hey, I can actually have a voice with this cryptocurrency and vote on like really important things through this nicely designed wallet. So now staking is not that simple. <laughs> it's not. <laughs> um, we have two ways of going about it. Sure. Sure. We um, have solo staking, which is, you know, a, a Jay-Z level operation. And then we have our stake pools. Mm-hmm. So let's get into what the stake pools are and and how are the stake pools integrated into Decrediton and how that whole process works. Sure. I, I think you're giving me too much credit here because, you know, like solo staking is not super complicated, but it is a little bit nerdy. What are you talking about? So, I can't do it. <laughs> you could. I, I, I could show you how to do it after we end this interview. But like the thing is, I mean, some people don't want to waste their time on, on CLI and I understand that, but it's, I don't think it's beyond anybody is what I'm saying. You know, if you, well, if, that's obvious, but sure. convenience, we have to think about that as well. Convenience wise, you probably don't want to use CLI. Um, but if, I'm if, not trying to leave my computer open with Linux all the time either. This is true. So basically the way Decred works is that, um, you know, to, to be able to look at these blocks and vote on their validity, you're going to have to have machines that are on 24-7 to do that voting. Um, and if you're solo voting, you're basically going to be managing all these machines yourself, Correct. right? Um, so what pools do is you kind of outsource some of that labor. You know, you'll tell a pool, you know, I want to vote X or Y. And the pool will go ahead and do that vote for you, respecting your wish. Uh, And that prevents you from having to have machines that are on all the time and do these votes. Um, What's cool about it is that, you know, pools can't steal your money. So when you're you're setting up with a pool, you're basically creating a a multi-sig whereby the pool has the rights to vote, but not the rights to spend the coins. So you're not really losing any security by using a pool. Um, you know, there are security issues in terms of a pool could be hacked and like your votes could go another way. Um, but you don't actually have funds at risk is what I'm getting at. So let's get into the Decred treasury and who controls it and 
how do you see it as an advantage over other projects? Right. Okay. So, um, you know, uh, again, Decred's all about, you know, these incremental improvements. And one of the things, one of the goals is to actually have that treasury totally controlled by the actual stakeholders. So right now the stakeholders, it belongs to the stakeholders. Um, the, the money is allocated by the stakeholders, but the actual signing of the transactions and broadcasting of them is happening by individuals. Um, and something we like to do is not have leaders, not have you know a single dude at a desk pressing a button. That 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 is a single point of failure, right? Um, so there's actually a proposal right now to build out that last piece of infrastructure, whereby the release of those funds happens in an automated fashion, and that's super important because that treasury, I mean, it's it's such a differentiator between other projects because it goes back to that longevity. You know, projects come out with like these these shower thoughts, you know, and you could have you have projects that have multi billion dollar market caps that are just science fair projects essentially, and they're not going to be around in five years. I mean, I, I would, I would bet that you know most of the coins in the top hundred by market cap in five years they you know they just won't be in the top hundred anymore. That that's already been proven, for sure. I mean, if if we look we, back, we could, put, we could look back on projects from twenty fifteen that were in the top ten that are just irrelevant for sure but people never realize it people always think you know my projects to be around forever but the reality is you know people move on if the incentives aren't aligned correctly you know uh, they'll want to, if they have another idea they won't necessarily integrate into that old project they'll, they'll move on to something else and with the whole ICO f- craze you know it's just it's kind of like a hit and run whereby people get these huge pools of capital under their control they spend them like they won the lotto and then they'll go move on to the next thing and there's no there's no incentive to actually complete what you've promised. Whereby with Decred, you know, uh, that pool of money and you know paying people in arrears allows us to build things, monitor what's being built, and actually have accountability. Correct. So now with that infrastructure being built, which is our latest proposal, what are the main advantages of having the treasury on other projects? So what you see with other projects is, you know, when someone has like a new idea in this space, what they go and do is they create a new coin. Um, and, you know, that's, that's fine and fun and whatnot, but it goes back to the whole longevity thing. You know, one of the core tenets of Decred is it's supposed to be adaptable. And to have that adaptability, you need capital to be able to, you know, change things and build new things. And that's what that treasury gives us. It gives us that flexibility to go and build new things and fund new ideas, such as Lightning Network, which we talked about, you know. We we think, you know, we can be a great store of value and also allow people to transact with things like Lightning, you know. So you can have both. You can have kind of that medium of exchange and storage of value. You know, Lightning opens the door to all sorts of smart contracts. So someone can come to Decred with a brilliant idea, um, get funded by us, and literally build it on top of Decred as opposed to having to create a coin from scratch um, that might be really messy and have one cool feature and be a flash in a pan and then disappear after a little bit of time. I mean, the former is really appealing potentially to people because, you know, it's exciting and you get to run your own project. But again, um, our idea is something that's around for 20, 30, 50 years is the goal here. And most projects just, they, they don't meet that bar. So now back to our voting infrastructure. Let's get into Politea and how it works. Cool. Okay, so with Politea, people are able to take their Decred tickets, which essentially represent locked up coins, and vote on things. So you mentioned the decentralized uh, treasury proposal. Now, what's what's cool about that is it's much like Lightning, whereby Marco wrote up a, propo- wrote up a proposal for his idea of how to decentralize the treasury, uh, decentralize the treasury funds, and what that basically entails is having um, two keys, basically an offline signing key, a Politea signing key, which signs a proposal for spun, for spending, and then have the stakeholders look at that proposal and have an on-chain vote whether or not to authorize that spending. Um, and through Politea, the way we're going to authorize the first part, the Politea part, is having a Politea vote, which requires 60% of stakeholders to vote yes to authorize that work to begin. Um, now, what that basically looks like is inside Decrediton, inside your wallet, much the way you vote on a consensus vote, you can see all those open agendas for, for Politea votes and decide whether or not you think this should be funded. It is, it is streamlined and well-designed within Decrediton, most definitely. One of Decred's features is security. 
let's get into that and how the hybrid proof of work proof of stake system helps defend Decred. Sure. So uh, coming back to that whole proof of work issue, um, you know, if if your coin is susceptible to you know fifty one percent attacks, if anyone can come and buy, rent or buy a bunch of hash power and suddenly control the whole network, um, it, it's problematic. So what Decred does is it adds this second layer on top whereby people have to look at those blocks and authorize them. So if you want to add a block to the chain, you need the explicit support of stakeholders. And that's essentially what we call that multi-factor authentication, that, that security uh, that, that, that prevents essentially proof of work from having all the control of the network. How is Decred's security model comparable with equal market caps? How is a hybrid system more secure than just a standalone proof of work system. Right. So w- one of our people, Zabair, had actually done some work on this. And the idea was that, you know, if, if Bitcoin were to take our hybrid proof of stake, proof of work, and implement that, uh, it would cost about 22 times as much to attack it, um, which, is, which is kind of staggering if you think about it, because it's already very expensive to attack Bitcoin. Um, making it 22 times more expensive is is quite impressive. And that's by virtue of the fact that not only do you need to have access to all that hash power, but you would need to own a bunch of Bitcoin to do it. So right now you can attack any proof of work coin without owning any coins. The thing with Decred is if you want to actually be able to attack the network, you're going to have to own a bunch of coins and have access to those to those votes, those on-chain, those on-chain votes to get those blocks published. Um, so, so that's what's interesting because it's protected by two markets, essentially. The market for Decred, whereby someone would have to go in and buy, acquire this Decred without pushing the price up to insane levels. Um, and then the ticket market. So the way tickets work is that there is a target pool size of 40,960 tickets. And then there's a stake difficulty algorithm that adjusts, adjusts to, keep the pri- to keep the price of tickets uh, at a level whereby the pool stays at that, at that 40,900 level. Um, so someone would have to go buy those tickets, which would essentially produce, uh, produce an effect where a second price is, is raised, the price of tickets. So they'd be forced to buy more and more decreds so that they could acquire more and more tickets at higher and higher prices to have a chance at manipulating the chain. Um, and overall, what we find is, you know, apples to apples, it would be 22 times more expensive than it would cost uh, to attack Bitcoin alone if Bitcoin were using essentially this model. Now, you've been in the space and involved with Decred since its inception, right? And I would say since 2016. Uh, what has changed from then till now? And, and what have you learned in the process with the right. project? So I, I joined after it, uh, it launched. So after mainnet launch, I mean, I received an airdrop. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm represented there in block one. Um, but I, I joined after it launched. Uh, and it, it's just been super interesting to watch it develop because I mean, everyone, myself included, was extremely skeptical about, about everything, right? Um, you know, the team behind Decred, the founding team, had great reputations, but there were so many unknowns. You know, there were unknown unknowns. Um, and what we found out is, you know, Decred actually just delivers. So it's, it's not one of those projects whereby people make all these claims, you know, we're going to do this, we're going to do that, and then, like, stuff falls by the wayside. I mean, when Mainnet launched, it delivered on the main promise, the main feature, essentially, that underlines the whole thing, stakeholders being in charge. So the day mainnet launched, Decred delivered on that. And since then, essentially, everything that's been proposed, um, you know, has has been built or is in the process of being built. Um, so, you know, it's not one of those things where, like, you know, you talk about something like Lightning Network and, you know, um, there might be 100 projects that say, you know, Lightning Network is coming, you know, coming soon, trademark. You know, and even we said that for a while, but the difference is that, you know, we actually have the ability to do this stuff because we've... We've attracted so much. I mean, you and I were having dinner last night with a couple of our devs, right? Uh, Luke Powell and Jamie Holdstock. And uh, it, was, it was interesting them talking about, you know, why they like working on the project. Just because, you know, people want to work with talented individuals. And, you know, they're willing to, to do whatever it takes to work with people who are, you know, the superstars of the space. And that's, what, that's what's been so cool about Decred is it just attracts amazing talent because it started with literally half a dozen of the best people in the space. And it's just, it's been like a multiplier effect. I mean, today we probably have 
two dozen really amazing devs, and it just continues growing. So that's that that is really something a networking effect that a lot of projects don't have, and and we can capitalize on that again because of the treasury and because of that self funding model. So, what are you most optimistic about when it comes to Decred's future? Um, I'm just optimistic about us being able to iterate and adapt to change. You know, um, so ideologies are fun. It makes it, it it can be amusing for us to laugh at you know that other group and say you know we're better we're smarter um, but the reality is there's going to be things that we don't know the answer to we're, there's going to be things where we need to make changes um, things where we're not experts and other people might have to come in and, and help us and just the ability to make changes uh, built into the protocol is super important the fact that we're not stuck with anything that we do you know um, there's no company behind Decred essentially that's got a vested interest in seeing Lightning Network. Uh, su- succeed you know if lightning network is a huge failure which i don't think it will be but if it is you know we can go hard fork it out and get the latest new thing that that's cool one day right um we're not stuck with any of our decisions you know because there's no one at the top with a huge ego who's like no it's got to be this way it's got to be big blocks if it's, if decray doesn't have 128 meg blocks in a year it's a failure um, no, we can be really pragmatic about stuff and we don't have to take this hard line ideological position because we have a mechanism on chain um, to make decisions as a group. And that's really what the coolest thing about Decred is, this baked in conflict resolution mechanism. I mean, uh, imagine if like you had to get divorced every time you and your wife couldn't f- choose a place to go to dinner, you know, and you, and you were getting married every week to someone new. Um, you know, it, it just wouldn't make any sense. And it doesn't make sense for a, a project either to have these kind of schisms that tear apart the communities. Now, what are some of your long-term concerns for Decred in the future? What are some of the holes that you see in the project? Uh, my biggest long-term concern is short-term thinking. And, you know, a lot of people watch the market super closely and, you know, they focus on price, price, price. And again, you know, when you build something that's designed to last decades, uh, you can't be looking at, like, how is the market reacting to it on a daily or, or weekly basis? And I, I think so far the community has been really good with this. And we, we see this reflected in the types, the quality of proposals that, uh, that get passed. But, you know, I would, I would always uh, recommend caution, you know, when looking at these proposals for things like, you know, um, short-term marketing budgets that are huge or budgets to get on exchanges because people think, you know, that'll pump the price or something. You know, I, I would caution against that stuff because, you know, Decred is going to survive longer than any of these centralized service providers will. So uh, the utility of being on a lot of them, you know, might be uh, a lot less than people assume. What's the emotional state of your relation with Decred in one word? One word? I mean, I... I Let's say it's complicated in quotation marks. <laughs> Give me a word. A marriage, as close to marriage as you can get without being married. <laughs> this is a question I ask everyone. Uh, what advice would you give Satoshi? I don't know if I'd be qualified to give Satoshi advice, but um, you know, uh, I think Bitcoin was done more as a proof of concept, and it worked really well. Um, but you know, uh, I'd say you know, finish the job. You know, build in an explicit governance mechanism. And maybe they did. Maybe one CPU, one vote was it. And uh, miners just haven't expressed their sovereignty uh, early enough. And when they finally did, they realized that, you know, someone else is in control. And people were so apathetic that they'll just run whatever code has the, the Bitcoin trademark on it. That was actually Vitalik's response. Really? Yeah. Oh, God, I feel dirty. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. I like that guy. Now I'm going to get into the bulletproof section, and this is a set of statements that I've gathered from the internet. Oh, it must be good then. And some questions, sure. <laughs> so I'll start with the first. If Decred was to fail, what would be the cause of its death? Uh, if the failure, it would be, uh, I'd say, apathy. If the stakeholders you know, just don't care. If they're like, hey, I'm going to collect this part of the block reward, and I'm not even going to look at these proposals. So pure rent-seeking. Yeah, and I think that like it's not an issue right now, but I'm always vigilant about that, and I want our stakeholders to be people who are engaged. I mean, I, I tell people not to buy Decred if I think that they just don't care about the underlying project. Um, I want the people who are involved to care deeply and understand what we're about and want to help us pursue those goals. Um, so, yeah. So let's get into the second one. Some say it's good for it to be difficult to change consensus. Decred does nothing special other than draw focus to a specific activation method baked into the protocol layer, which could be ported into any other project. Yeah, that's that's interesting because, I mean, um, 
it should be hard to change the consensus rules. It is hard to change the consensus rules with Decred. It requires, you know, 75% of tickets voting yes. But the issue is, at some point, you need to change these rules sometimes. I mean, Bitcoin hasn't had... Um, an issue whereby, you know, like something like SHA-256 is broken and you need a new proof of work algorithm, right? Um, you know, who's going to get to make that decision one day? Is it going to be the miners? Do they get to decide what the next algo is so that they can continue rent seeking? Is it going to be a centralized group of developers in a smoky room choosing a new one? Um, so it, it, it makes sense to have some kind of formal mechanism. Dude, as for, you know, just like, hey, you know, let's rip off Decred and we can, we can add that into our coin. The thing about governance is... If you don't start off with it, you're basically screwed. Because, I mean, once you have a bunch of people who are in charge, people rarely want to relinquish control. You know, if I make you king of this country, you know, what, what's your incentive to give up all the power and all the wealth and all the status that go with that position? Um, so it's very rare you're going to have someone who's willing to give up that power, even because the community doesn't want them. There, there are instances, I'm sure, whereby, you know, a project has a leader who's, you know, charismatic and good at their job. And people are like, no, I don't want that guy to step down and give up power. They're doing such a good job. I mean, forget about the fact they could be hit by a bus or have something happen to them, you know, or, you know, just get sick of the project and walk away. Um, so, yeah, it doesn't make sense to vest power with individuals in that way, I don't think. So now we'll get into the third Bitcoin launch without a pre-mine, all other projects outside of Bitcoin are built around the financial interest of their creators. Right. Well, that's, that's kind of a loaded statement, right? Because, I mean, Bitcoin launch without a pre-mine, I mean, we don't even, we don't know a lot of things about Bitcoin, right? Uh, people kind of conflate lack of information with transparency in Bitcoin, right? How many coins does the Satoshi team have? I mean, we don't know how long they mined when we started. We, we can associate um, certain addresses to them potentially, but we don't know the magnitude. Were they miners? You know, did they bang out an ASIC on their own and continue mining like up until today? I mean, we just don't know, right? So I think all coins benefit their creators to some point, right? Uh, Which I don't see anything wrong with that. No, I mean, that's capitalism, right? I mean, people create things because, you know, they got an itch they want to scratch and they're hoping they can benefit from something. Now it's the amount and the transparency that concerns me. That, that's the thing, right? So, I mean, Decred's, Decred's always been about transparency. And, like, you can go look on the, on the chain and see, hey, you know, this is how many coins were pre-mined. You can go see, you know, that the majority of the dev pre-mined was never moved. It's still sitting there, you know, in block one, untouched, you know. Uh, you can go see how many of those airdrops were claimed by people like like myself and, and moved and whatnot. And you can go see those community members to this day participating in our various channels and, and working on the project. So I think, you know, Bitcoin was special because, you know, they were first. You know, nobody knew it was coming and the learning curve was steep enough that, you know, it, was, it didn't get this huge rush of people who were able to capitalize on it and kind of like corner that market. But, you know, that's never going to happen again. You know, projects, projects nowadays are pretty much, um, you know, all, all allocated towards people who, who fund it, um, you know, through, through ICOs. Uh, you don't have too many projects that start up natively and, uh, and are a pure proof of work. I think if you did, they'd probably get, you know, taken to the cleaners by miners that just go in there and speculate and grab all the coins and then try and, you know, flip them. Now, this fourth statement is a shot at the treasury. People will invest in things that make the world better. Whether it be time or money, they will invest. You don't need a dev fund embedded into your protocol to incentivize development. Making the world a better place is pretty, a pretty strong incentive. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, that doesn't seem compatible with, like, reality and capitalism, right? I mean, this laptop we're looking at... It, cost money to make there's technology involved in it um you need a capital to produce it um it's it's nice to think you know people will will build want to build cool things and like work on cool stuff if you've got the luxury of you know mining bitcoin in 2010 you can go work on whatever you want probably you don't you don't have to worry about that kind of stuff but you know look at the majority of our dozens of developers who work on decred you know they quit their jobs to come work on decred full-time they got to pay their rent they got to eat food they got families right um being able to have those people work on the project, not be beholden to some corporate entity that's letting them work on the project and may have another agenda, um, you know, and advancing all of our goals as, as a unit, um, that's worth something to me. And I don't see how you get there without having you know, a project run by people who are obscenely wealthy and just can do whatever they want, which would have its own problems, 
or having having a treasury, having a means of compensating your, your people. All right, Jay, what are your closing thoughts and a message to newcomers and potential stakeholders? Yeah, you know, I mean, Decred's always growing. Uh, we're, we're really welcoming and, you know, we're always looking for people who are motivated to, you know, do their own thing. So, I mean, you don't need to be a dev. We're always looking for dev talent, but people who just want to be part of the community, they might be lurking. I mean, we got thousands of people who I know are lurking on all sorts of channels and maybe they think that they can't help and they can't do anything, but that's, that's totally wrong. You know, we want these people, these people are our greatest asset. Like I said, you know, we don't, when you don't have the issue of all these schisms happening, tearing the communities apart and we can move together as one cohesive unit, um, you can really, really uh, leverage that community. And I want all these people to come and, you know, offer to do things, do things and tell us you're doing them, you know, and, we can also pay you is, is the cool thing. So th- I, I want more contractors. That's what I want. More people working to help support this network. And that's how we're going to get to where we want to be in terms of growth. Well, Jay, that wraps up the show. Thank you for your time. Already? That's it. We actually need to go in depth on the next episode. Yeah, definitely. We'll do a, we'll do a Jay-Z part two and, <laughs> and go a little more in depth. But I feel we covered everything that's important within the project. So I appreciate your time and... It's been my pleasure.